Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Well, it's still morning. So good morning. <laughs> well, I guarantee you we'll go in the afternoon. Yeah. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come before you now in the precious and wonderful name of Jesus, and we ask that you would speak to each of us. And Lord, I pray over this service, what Paul prayed over the Ephesian church, that you would give them the spirit of revelation of wisdom and revelation so they may know you better. And so, Lord, we ask for that spirit of wisdom and revelation, the work of the Holy Spirit, to enlighten our eyes to who you are, that we might know you and walk with you. And, Lord, if there's anybody here that is not in right relationship with you, that you would bring them home. In Jesus' name, amen. What we're going to look at this morning is the power of the atonement. We're going to look at the atonement. And uh, if you're a new Christian or never been a believer, you may not even understand what that word atonement means. And that's all right. By the time this message is done, you'll understand it at least somewhat. And I'm going to begin at a very well-known verse that we might not think of, but it does reveal the atonement in some very simple and basic ideas. That's John 3.16. So you know that. Many of you have it memorized, and if you're not even a follower of Jesus, you've probably heard this verse one way or the other. Uh, it's very simple. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. The heart of the gospel is forgiveness. That's the heart of it. Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn the world. He came into the world to give life to those who would repent and turn to him. And so the idea that God so loved the world is the motivation behind what God did, why he sent his son, why the son went through all the agony of the cross and why he became human in the first place was because God so loved the world. And the world in this setting, in this, in this sense here, is not referring to the world in which we're standing upon, but the people of this world. And so he's referring to, the, to mankind in general. God loved mankind, and he gave his one and only son to be an atoning sacrifice for him. I really don't very often talk about a movie. Um, you know, I don't have cable or anything like that. Jesse are, and I are very, very, very selective in what we watch. And uh, I don't want to watch anything I've got to repent of. Because if I got to repent of it when I'm done watching it, I really wasn't caring about being right with God either in, in the whole situation because I was going to do it no matter what. But there's this movie that was produced by The Voice of the Martyrs. And uh, excellent movie. It's about Sabrina Wormbrand. And Voice of the Martyrs was started by Richard and Sabrina Wormbrand. They were Romanians. They were uh, in Romania during the Nazi occupation and what went on. They were both Jews that became Christian and he became a Lutheran minister. And so he didn't end up being taken away like the rest of the Jews were because he had become a follower of Jesus. But uh, he was still severely persecuted, spent years and years in prison as a result of his faith and standing up to the, the lies of the world, of the Nazi regime and all that went on. And so that movie on Sabrina shows how she comes to salvation and then what kind of woman she becomes after salvation. And there's one scene in that movie that is so powerful, and it's not make-believe. This is real life. This is what happens. So this is just taking a historical event and putting it to movie that we could see what God had done in a person. Sabrina's family remained Jewish, and they were taken by the Nazis. They were taken to whatever part of of uh, Romania or wherever else they were taken, but there was this man that was dubbed the butcher, and he had killed all kinds of Jews, gloated over it, rejoiced over the butchery of them, and he was at the place where Sabrina's family was sent to, and he was probably the one who killed them. He ends up in the 
apartment complex where Richard and Sabrina are living. Richard hears about it. He goes up to the people and goes into the apartment to be able to talk to this man. He was just staying for a little bit and begins to share with him the gospel and then brings him down to his own apartment. And the guy went and says, I don't believe in God. And he says, I can prove to you that there is a God. How can you prove that? He says, you wait here a second. And he goes into his bedroom where Sabrina was asleep and wakes her up and says, Sabrina, in our living room is the man who killed your family. That woke her up. She got out of bed, put on her robe, goes out in the living room, and here's this man that's standing there, the murderer of her family, of her parents, of her siblings. And she walks up to him and throws her arms around him. And he says, forgiveness is the heart of the gospel. The man broke down weeping, and then she took his head in her hands and kissed his cheek. You see, that's what God can do through the atonement and changing people, that he can demonstrate this love through people. He can so transform them that in the natural there would be nothing but hatred and vengeance. You want to say cruel and bitter things to the man that was the murder of, his, of her family, but instead she was saturated with the love of Christ because Christ had loved her because she was as vile a sinner just with other names of sin than what that man was. And so Christ came to save all sinners, to redeem all sinners. And to do this is a miracle that is greater than you and I can even understand. And I'm going to share some of that in what this atonement is all about. But I will only begin to share just a little sliver of it because the infinite quality of God is infinite as an atonement. And there are benefits of the atonement beyond what we can even understand. Some we understand and some we can appropriate to our lives. But this was an expression of the Father's love for mankind. And so, because the Father loved, He sent His Son. And because the Son loved, He was sent. And so He was sent to this world to die upon the cross, but he was sent not just to die for those people in Jerusalem at that time, and not just for the ancient world at that time, but he was sent for you. He was sent for you. Why did he give his only begotten son? It was a selfless act of the Father. He didn't do it because he was going to get something out of it, because he doesn't need mankind. The justice of God could have destroyed mankind in the, in the moment that Adam and Eve rebelled, but the goodness and kindness of God, the mercy of God was made manifest that held back his hand, and yet the justice of God still had to be acted upon, and so there was the wages of sin that came upon Adam and Eve and was passed on to all of mankind. So all of mankind suffers under the sin of Eve and Adam, and they suffer under their own sins because they perpetuate those same sins themselves right now in this world. You see, there's a God that really cares. It's towards the end of his ministry, just days, just be days before he was going to be crucified. He was told about Lazarus, that Lazarus was sick and that he died. And Jesus finally comes to the tomb of Lazarus four days after he was dead. And so this is God incarnate. This is God Almighty that breathed stars out of his mouth, that took upon flesh and blood, 
and had come to that very place, to the tomb of Lazarus, and he knew what he was going to do. There wasn't a question. He wasn't doubting what was going to happen. He knew he had all power. He knew he had all power over the grave and over those who are in hell and those who are, who are in a place of waiting until they could go to heaven. He knew the souls of people departed. He knew where they were. He knew what he was going to do. And yet when he comes there, we have the shortest verse in the Bible that says that Jesus wept. Do you understand? He knew what he was going to do. He knew just in moments he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. He was going to reach in to the place beyond this life and grab hold of the soul of one individual and grab that soul and put it back in that body and then heal that body of whatever killed him and bring life into it that it was flowing with blood and breath was back in him. He knew what he was going to do, yet he wept. He wept over the pain and the suffering of people because he cares beyond what we can imagine. But how often is it that we think that God does not care? Life gets hard, and so we say, where are you, God? And we fail to understand that he is nearer than we can even comprehend and that he does care beyond what we can ever imagine. And so why did the Father give his Son so that you and I and everybody on this planet will not have to perish. And what does he mean by perish? He is referring to the aspect of eternal separation from God. The Father sent the Son so that we would not have to go to hell. He made the way for us to be rescued. He made the way that we could be pardoned. Now it's up to us what we do with that. He's not going to force anybody to repent. He's not going to force anybody to turn from their sin. He's not going to force anybody to, to go into a place of fellowship with this God and seek his face and long to know him. He'll force nobody. He welcomes. He invites. He even shows us the wonder and the superiority of a life of faith in Christ. But we still have to make the choice ourselves. It's still up to us. And so what is the condition to receive this gift of eternal life for us, it is to believe, to have faith in Christ. And to have faith in Christ is not this thing that I just say, I believe that he exists because we're told in Scripture that devils believe that Jesus exists. They know the Bible better than you and I do. That faith that we're called to is the trust of our life where we throw ourselves upon the mercy and kindness of God and begin to follow him. It is not some half-hearted Sunday morning only type of devotion. It is the whole abandonment of our life because we need him in every portion of our being. And so the gift of eternal life is not a thing, is not a force. It's a person. We've got to understand it is a person for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. And that's verse 17 of chapter 3 of John. And so the gift of, not, of eternal life is not eternal life. It is the one who is life. You understand, that's the prize we get. Heaven is heaven, like I said last night. Heaven is heaven because God is there. Hell is hell because God is not there. Life comes through that relationship with Christ. And if we are not in relationship with him, we are not in eternal life. And because you prayed a prayer once and you said, oh, Jesus, come into my life, doesn't mean you are right with God. It just means you prayed a prayer. And if you didn't mean it, then your life has not been changed by it. Those who have been truly born again have been radically transformed by the power of God. The manifestation of a transformed life is there for everyone to see. And if you are no different than what you were before, then you are not truly saved. You are still in a lost condition. You are still separated from the life of Christ. Because when the life of Christ comes into you, nothing will stay the same. Nothing will stay the same. In John chapter 6, verses 47 and 48, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, he who believes has everlasting life. And then he says, I am the bread of life. And so what did he say there? What was he saying? He says, I'm life. I'm the bread of life. For you to have eternal life, you must devour me. You must eat me. You must get your sustenance from me. I must become your everything, not a something, not a part of your life, but I must be the thing that is consuming you because you are consuming me. And so this biblical faith is actually very radical. We try to water it down and tame it down, dumb it, 
so that it might be more acceptable to people. But if they don't come into the true faith, no matter how acceptable the gospel might be to the masses, it doesn't save. It's the true gospel that saves. Jesus said in John chapter 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. But how is this gift of life given? This is where we start looking at the atonement. How can God give life to people that are at war with him? How can he give life to those who are practicing the very things that produce eternal damnation, eternal death? How can this happen? Well, it began with the incarnation where God took upon flesh and blood. And it was finished through his work on the cross, the atonement. And so the gift deals with the problem of why people can't go to heaven. You understand? People cannot go to heaven. Not by themselves. There is no hope for any person in the natural for going to heaven. Every single person is destined for damnation apart from a miracle. And so God made a way of escape. And there's only one way of escape. There's not multiple ways. There's only one way. And if we do not take his way, then we do not escape from what this world is going to dish out and what we are going to receive for the just, for the, as justice because of our rebellion. So we have this big, big problem. And it comes out really simply in 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. Everyone who sins breaks the law. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. Every sin is an act of lawlessness. Every sin. We can go and say, well, their sin, they're unsaved out there. Their, their sin's lawless. But mine's just a little mistake. Sin is not a mistake. Mistakes aren't sin. Sin is deliberate acts of rebellion against God. It is lawless. So the sin of a Christian is lawless just as much as the sin of a non-Christian. Both are in desperate need of repentance because if the Christian continues in sin, they will sin themselves right out of salvation. And so here we have this, this terrible problem. How do we deal with the guilt that is upon us because of sin? How do we deal with it? Because we will answer to God. Every person will stand before God and answer to him of what they did with their life. And it's at that point that the reality of whether or not they were truly born again, truly walking with Jesus, or just some religious people, or people that were just agnostic or atheistic, the truth will come out what they really were. Sin produces death. What sin produces death? Are there the particular sins that produce death? No. Every sin produces death. Every sin. We want to say that our sin is a little different. No, sin produces death. Period. We can't argue around it. We can't get away from it. It is the fact. It is a reality that sin produces death. What kind of death does it produce? Well, of course, it's going to produce physical death. But it's going to produce spiritual death. It's going to produce relational death. It's going to produce death on the inside of a person with all the turmoil and guilt that sin produces in the person. It kills every part of a life. And if it's not dealt with, the end result is the actual reality of death and separation from God. And so what's the obstacle to gaining eternal life? I want to disturb you with this. You know the obstacle to attain eternal life? God. He is the obstacle to it because he is just, he is holy, he is perfect, he is without fault. And there's no way a holy, perfect God will let wickedness into his heaven. No evil person, no wicked person, no person in the practice of sin will make heaven their home. The obstacle to heaven is God himself. The remedy to get to heaven is also God himself. But we have to understand how it's done. So the question is, how does a holy God let unholy people into heaven? So if God is holy, if he's just, 
And if only people that are pure, that are clean from sin, will make heaven their home, how do we come from the place of being wicked, evil people to become righteous before God in a way that he will embrace us and accept us? That's what the atonement's all about. People may not think it through and understand what this really is, but the remedy is the atonement. God made the way that there could be a remedy to our sin, to the sin that we are so easily given over to, to the sin that we practice. There is an answer. There's a remedy to it. And it's a perfect, sinless sacrifice. In the Old Testament, all this thought is, is, is laid out. That's part of the purpose of the Old Testament. Because you have this thing that's called salvation history. It begins right in Genesis. And it goes right on through as it unfolds more and more. And becomes fuller and fuller until the revelation of Jesus. And now we have the revelation. God incarnate in flesh and blood here. Giving us the wonder of what the salvation is. And then making the way that it could be obtained. The very first atonement that took place was in the Garden of Eden. After Adam and Eve sinned, it tells us that they were naked. They knew they were naked, and it says God took animal skins and clothed them. Atonement. The first death that came in the world was the death spiritually. And the effects of that would be their separation from God. But next was the aspect, the need of atonement. And an animal had to be sacrificed to clothe them of their nakedness. That is so spiritually speaking of what the atonement is for us. We are naked, raw in our sin, in our rebellion against God. We are exposed in the reality of it that our life is hostile to him. And yet God made a way that we could be cleansed and clothed with righteousness so that we can stand before him. When you begin to look at the Old Testament as it unfolds in the Mosaic Law, within the Mosaic Law was all these various sacrifices. And the sacrifices all ultimately point to Jesus. They are all prophetic in nature. But you know, there's something that is so interesting about this. Is there's all kinds of pagan religions out there, old ones and even ones present, that do sacrifices. They sacrifice. I mean, so what's the difference of the pagan Rituals of sacrifice to the Jewish expressions of sacrifice. They are huge. There is no comparison between the two. Because the pagan expressions of sacrifice was an effort to try and appease the gods. To try and earn their favor. To buy off the gods. To bribe the gods in essence. You'd have ancient Roman cities that would have their patron deity and what they do is they build a temple at the entrance of the gate, just outside the gate. It'd be outside so that everybody that came into that city or village would know the patron deity that supposedly protects that city. You know what the Catholic Church did? They took patron idols and called them patron saints and do the same identical thing. I'm not going to get off on that, but people don't understand some of the evil that is there. Terrible, terrible, terrible idolatry. Atonement is not about trying to appease God. Atonement is that we are guilty before God, and God is making the way of escape, that our sins can be cleansed, that we can be made right before God and accepted by him. It's not trying to buy him off. It's not trying to earn his favor. It's the reality that we come before him and say, I have sinned. I am at war with you. My, my life is miserable because I have practiced sin. I'm coming to you, God, to accept your atonement, to accept your gift that I could be made right with you. It's not earning anything because you can't earn right standing with God. So the word atonement is really an, an interesting one. It was created by a man named William Tyndale. And he wrote his English translation in 1526. And there is no word that translates for atonement from the Hebrew and the Greek into English. So he invented the word. So it was the first time it ended up in his, his translation and it became the standard of what we use because it was such a good idea that was there. It's a combination of two theological terms. The first is, is propitiation, which means to atone for. And the second is reconciliation, which means to cover. And so that word atonement is the idea that God is going to atone or propitiate our sins and reconcile us to himself. There's no other remedy. There's no other way to salvation. There's no other way to get into heaven but the way that he has made. The atonement is the only way. Either we go through his atonement to get 
to the place of heaven or we don't get to heaven at all. And so Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, it says, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. It's the reality of it. It's what the atonement of the Old Testament was all about. But it was only temporal. What Jesus did was once and for all, eternal, complete. But you know, you want to think about the picture of this? Let me just describe the picture of this. You have sin. In the Old Testament, let me really disturb you. In the Old Testament, there was no forgiveness for intentional sin. There was only forgiveness for unintentional sin. That's why when people committed adultery, there was no forgiveness. When they committed murder, there was no forgiveness. That's why David was under a death penalty from God. And he didn't go to God in Psalms 51 and says, God, I'm going to offer up all these sacrifices. That's why all, he, all that was left was saying, have mercy on me, God. I am guilty. And I'm glad to say mercy was enough. So what you do is if you had sin, you could go and take a lamb to the temple and they have to make sure it was a perfect offering. You take it up to the priest then and you lay hands on the head of that animal and you look in the eyes of that animal and you take your sins that are on you and you put them on that animal. But the wages of sin is death. Somebody has to die for your sins. Somebody has to die. So who's going to die in this setting? It would be that innocent lamb that never sinned in its life. They slit the, the man slits the animal's throat, and then the blood is poured out as an atonement for sin. How does salvation come to people that we come to Christ, and in essence we do the same identical thing? We put our hands upon the head of the Lamb of God. We look in those holy, perfect, sinless eyes. And we confess our sins. We take the reality of our sins off of ourselves and put it upon the Savior. And he must die, so we must slit his throat. Somebody has to die for our sins. There is no way out of that. The remedy is Christ and only Christ and what he has done for us. Jesus, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed. Three times he asked the Lord, Father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not what I will, but as you will. If there was another way for mankind to be saved, the Father would have provided it. If I might say it like this, Jesus praying to the Father, this is the only time he didn't answer the prayer by giving what the Son wanted, but the Son submitted fully, completely, and absolutely to the Father's will. And he went. He went to the cross. He went willingly. When he was in the garden, after he was done interceding, and the soldiers come up to him, and the, and the, the, the priests and so on, they come up to take him away. Jesus walks up to them. He didn't run away, didn't try and hide. His time came. And he says, who do you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they said. And it tells us that when he said, I am he, they were all knocked down. I'll tell you what, that had to shake them to, to, to the core of their being. I mean, all these soldiers are falling down, swords flying, shields going all over, you know. I mean, it's like they're just, they just overwhelmed. You know, and they're stumbling to get back up and to grab their sword and their shield again. And there's Jesus just standing there. You know what he's saying? I'm going, I'm laying my life down. I am willingly being the Lamb of God. You are not making me. You see, this was the love of God, again and again expressed. And so atonement, Christ's atonement is the only way that sin can be removed. There's no other way. And so this idea of atonement here, of removing sin, the theological term is expiate. So you don't have to remember that. But expiate means to remove sin, that, that there is the way that sin can be removed. And when sin is removed, then we have this wonderful verse in the book of Psalms, that he says he removes our sins from us as far as the east is from the west. I mean, he removes our sins. It's not like he says, I'm going to storm up here and bring them back to your remembrance. He says, I've, I've forgiven them. They're done away with. They're not going to be brought up again. When you stand before me at your judgment, I will not deal with those because those have been covered by my atonement, by my atoning blood. You are forgiven. You have been redeemed as a result of it. So how can the guilt of a sinner be removed? 
Well, it has to be through an act of divine justice where justice is satisfied and the responsibility to punish is canceled. There must be a substitute. Now imagine you have this man that is a murderer. He's standing trial. The jury came up with guilty because all the evidence showed and proved that the man was guilty. He's ready to be sentenced by the by the judge. And then he says, Judge, can I say something, please? Uh, judge, you know, I have, I have been a good man. Just look at my life. I've been a good man. I Look at all the charities I have given to and all the work and all the people I helped. And everybody knows that I was a nice guy. And, you know, Judge, I've only murdered one person. So could you just, just have mercy, forgive me for that? I mean, doesn't my good deeds outweigh my bad? And if the judge went and says, well, that's a pretty good argument. I think I'll let you go. What would everybody be thinking? Was that a good judge or a bad judge? That would be an absolutely terrible judge. I guarantee you the family of the murdered man would be enraged because justice was not dealt with. Justice was not satisfied. But now just think of this. Let's say his father was in the courtroom. And as he's listening to the whole trial, the father's just weeping in agony over his son. And he knows this man is guilty. He's absolutely guilty. He deserves to be in prison for the rest of his life. And the judge makes his decree, says life imprisonment. And then the father stands up and says, judge, could I say something? And the father goes and he says, I will take my son's place. He's young. He has years before him. I'm old, I will take his place in prison. And what would we think if the judge went and says, I think that's a good idea, you take his place. What would we think? Was justice served? You see, what I'm portraying here is what Jesus did as a substitute. But the reason why I'm bringing this out is because this idea in our world, in our natural world, in our governmental systems cannot work. It would be the undoing of any justice system in any part of the world because it would be all the contingencies and all the little things that would be there. And I like you, so you're not going to pay the penalty of your, of your crime. But the atonement is not a man-made thought. It is a divine act, a divine thing that he did. And it is not according to the way the world does things, but the way that God does things. So God made the way that the guilt of mankind could be put upon the shoulders of the Son who was perfect and innocent and absolutely holy. And he took those sins and he bore the penalty of the crimes of those sins. He bore the wrath of those sins. He was cast to hell for three days because of those sins. But because he was himself without sin, hell could not hold him. So we have these beautiful terms in the New Testament of Jesus being the Lamb of God, our Passover Lamb, our, you know, that his own blood put away the, our sin and the sacrifice of himself so that we could be forgiven. This is so full, so rich, this idea of atonement is so powerful in the word of God. But it always, it always implies repentance. Always. The atonement was made, but the benefit of the atonement can only be known to those who will take the path of repentance. Who will return from their sin by turning to God with all of their heart, mind, soul, and strength. Christ's atonement also includes the way that people are made favorable to God. Well, you have to think about this. That man that had committed that murder was not in favor with the judge, with the people of the land, with the government. He was out of favor because he had done a horrendous act of murder. He was guilty before all of them. So how do you take a person that is stained with the reality of sin, that is out of favor with God because of their willful rebellion, how do you take a person that is not in favor with God and bring them into a place of favor? Because it's not just enough that, his, that the blood of Christ has cleansed them. There must be more that's going on here to work this whole work of atonement. And it's how God takes somebody that is out of favor and brings them into favor. And so, theologically, this is called propitiation. This is where God takes the sinner that is hostile to God 
and atones for their sin and reconciles them in the place of, of becoming favorable. And so how is a person made favorable? By removing the offense. Sin, the sin nature, and our unholiness are offensive to God. Do you understand? It's not just sin, the name of sin itself. It's that we are by nature sinners. It's what we are on the inside of our life. So we can go and say, I don't sin as bad as that person. But it's the sin nature that separates you from God. And God has to do something in the transformation of you that you can become a person that will receive the favor of God. And that's what God wants. He wants to bring us to a place that we can receive his favor. So just imagine this. You have this terrorist, this anarchist, that does not want the king to rule. And so he has raised a rebellion against the king. And every chance that he gets, every way that he can do it, he tries to bring down the king and his kingdom. And so all these attacks against his military, against the people, all the thievery, all the bloodshed, the man is wanted. There's a huge bounty on his head. And one day, the king is sitting on his throne. And however it happened, they didn't know. But all of a sudden, this terrorist, this man who was the head of that organization, walks into the throne room. And all of a sudden, all the soldiers are around him. And he says, let me speak to the king. And he made sure he had no weapon, nothing there. And the man is allowed then to walk up. Guards all around him. Walk up. And he comes to the steps up to the throne. And he throws himself at the feet of the king. And he begins to confess the reality of what he's done. I have been an evil man. I have done evil. I have blood on my hands. I have killed all kinds of people. I have done horrendous acts. And I know there is justice that should be executed against me because I am absolutely guilty. I confess my guilt. I confess the reality of my guilt. It is so great. But I ask that you have mercy. So what does the king do? This man has been an enemy. He's not in favor with the king. So the king does two things. The first thing he does is he says, I give you a pardon. You are forgiven of all those crimes, so it's as if you are not guilty. Now you are brought into a type of favor. But he does something more. You know what he does? He went before everybody there. He says, I choose this day to adopt this man as my son. He took a man that was an absolute rebel, rebel and, and transformed him right before them all to become favorable, to be able to receive the kindness of God because he put himself in a place of repentance and the king responded to that. This is what Christ has done for us. He's made the way that we can be truly forgiven of our sins and be brought into favor that God that longs to be a good, kind, loving God to us to manifest that aspects of his nature. He does not want to pour out his wrath upon people. He wants to demonstrate his love and mercy. And when we give him opportunity, what does he do? He showers it upon us. Like, like uh, John tells us in his first epistle, he lavishes upon us that love. Lavishes upon us. Because while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He made the way of escape that we could truly be forgiven. You see, so how can a holy God remove our sins and make us holy? By satisfying the demands of divine justice. The price of your sin must be paid for. You understand? That's an absolute. There's no way we can get away from that. Somebody's going to die for your sins. Somebody has to die for them. Now, it might be that a loving mother might go and say, well, I will die that my child might live. But let that mother get a glimpse of hell. Let that mother get a smell of the stench and hear the cries and get an understanding of the agony, and that mother won't do it because the price is too great. Nobody will pay that price for another. Nobody will pay that price except one. And so Jesus made the way that we could be made holy 
He satisfied the demands of divine justice by paying the price so that God could freely give us a pardon. He took our sin so that we could be made righteous. He satisfied the obligation of the law that demands justice. He satisfied it. In this way, God can bless repentant sinners, people that are not anymore in the practice of sin, that have surrendered themselves to Christ. Jesus satisfied the justice of divine wrath through the cross. You and I don't understand how radical that is. We don't understand how radical that is because we downplay our sins so much and we don't see divine judgment at the judgment seat of Christ. When it happens there, we don't see the reality of it. Depart from me, I never knew you. But we need to understand as much as we can, as humanly possible, the reality that our sin is absolutely horrendously evil. And there is no remedy for it apart from Christ. Now let's go back to this king. This king was having a problem in his land. It wasn't just the aspect of these terrorists or these anarchists. It was the aspect of corruption that was going through his judicial system and through all portions of his government. And he had to do something. He was a good king, a righteous king, and so he had to somehow stem it. And so what he did is he made a decree that anyone who is found guilty of taking or giving a bribe will be given 100 lashes. So I figured the penalty would be severe enough that it would begin to deter people. It wasn't long, though, until somebody dear to him was found guilty, his mother. His mother was found out. The dowager was found out to be taking bribes. She was found guilty. The day of her receiving 100 lashes was set. Until that time, this woman that knew, knew the, the, the pleasures of being royal, she was put in a jail. And the king comes out on the day of her whipping. And he watched his mother come out in rags. Despair all over her, horror upon her face. Watch her as she was taken up to the whipping post. Her hands picked up and she's tied to the whipping post. And then her back is ripped, her, her clothes is ripped open to make her back bare. And then the executioner stands back. And with the might that he had, that whip comes across her back. And the son, the king, heard her agonizing cry heard her weeping because of the pain of it. And another lash comes across her back. And when a third one is ready to fall, the king says, stop, stop. And he walks up to her and he unties her. And he takes her to some people of the royal court and says, tend to my mother. Justice must be satisfied. You understand? She committed a crime. Justice must be satisfied. So the king goes out there. He ties himself to the post, rips off his shirt, ties himself to the post, and then he commands the executioner to say, give me the full extent of it. Don't hold back. Let every lash be the greatest and the strongest that you can do because justice must be satisfied, the full extent of it. That's what Jesus did for us. Took the full extent of of the judgment that should be upon us. And so included with the atonement is a third part that's called reconciliation. Sin separates us from God every time. Do you understand, church? Our sin separates us from God. That's why we are given, according to Romans 2, 4, that the goodness and kindness of God leads us to repentance. It's not just brings us into salvation. It restores that relationship that starts getting, getting rough or separated because of sin that we start giving over to. Reconciliation is restoring harmony between two people that are at odds. Now, for us people, it is usually guilt on both sides. But between us and God, there was no guilt on his part. It was 100% our rebellion against him. So reconciliation is offered to us that this God who is holy, good, and kind goes to the sinner and says, I have made a way that you can be reconciled to me. I paid the price of your sin. I did it all for you. 
But now you must turn to me and cry out to me and be reconciled. And he made the way that we could be. In our sin, we cannot be reconciled. But through Christ's atonement, we can be restored in the fellowship or brought into fellowship that maybe we've never had. Every sinner is in rebellion against God. Every person needs atonement. The only ones that are going to receive the benefits of the atonement are those who would take the path of repentance. What a tragedy that the mass of humanity is going to face the wrath of God because they refuse to accept the gift of God and the price that God paid that they could be reconciled to him, that they could be redeemed. And so God made the way to remove what separates us from him, which is sin. 1 John chapter 4, verse 10. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice, a propitiation, as some translations translate it, for our sins. This is love. This is the love of God made so wonderfully, horrifyingly beautiful before us that he would pay that price that he allowed his back to be ripped open for our healing, that he allowed his hands and feet to be nailed to a cross, the crown of thorns on his head, the mockery, the spitting, the beatings that he had. And the whole time he remained silent because all it would have taken an almighty God is one word and there would have been no more planet Earth. He endured the cross so that we could be reconciled to him so he could make us favorable, so we could have our sins forgiven by the just act of God in Calvary. And so the Father sent the Son to save people. So let me ask a question to you. What are you saved from? What are you saved from? If he came to save people, what did he save them from? Now, if somebody's saved, there should be a manifestation of salvation. There should be a manifestation they've been saved. So if you are saved, what have you been saved from? Or are you the same person you've basically been? Now you just go to church on Sunday morning. What are you saved from? Are you saved from sin? Are you saved from the practice of sin? Are you saved from your lust, from your pride, from your anger? Are you saved from the very things that destroy marriages? And so that husbands have this nasty attitude, are you saved from that, that no longer you're that mean man or you're no longer that that angry woman? Are you saved from those things of sin and the actions of sin that separates you from God and ultimately separates you from others? Are you saved? Because when salvation is there, there's always going to be the manifestation of it in people's lives. doesn't mean we're perfect, but I'll tell you what, that sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit keeps making us grow more and more and more like Jesus. You see, saving repentance should not be due to the terror of divine judgment, but it should be our horror of judgment that was brought upon Jesus. That we realize, personally realize, my sin, my sin. He went to the cross for me. It was my guilt. My guilt is so evil, the only remedy for it was for God to become human and die on a cross. That's what needs to be the reality in our minds about what sin is. And we have thought so little about sin that we don't even comprehend how evil it is. But if we're saved from sin and all the expressions of sin, what are we saved to? You see, if we're saved from something, we're saved to something. What are you saved to? Are you saved to a life of righteousness? Are you saved to a life of loving like Jesus? Saved to loving your spouse? As Paul teaches in in the book of Ephesians, where husbands love your wife like Jesus loved the church wives, love your husband as a church is to love Christ. Are we saved to that? Are we saved to a life of devotion? Are we saved to a life of service? Are we saved to a life that is trying to bring glory to God in every way that we can in our life, where we work, what we do, our home, and trying to reach the lost. Are we saved to what we are supposed to be saved to? Just imagine that you are sitting in this beautiful setting. It's this big, slow, 
moving river. And you're sitting there in a lawn chair. It's just a beautiful, nice day. I mean, not too hot, not cold, just perfect. And you're sitting there, and you're just enjoying your time. And all of a sudden, you have a vision. And in that vision, you see Jesus, a distance, but you see him start walking towards you. And as you look and you stare and you are just dumbfounded at what's going on, you see Jesus getting closer and closer. And as he gets closer, you see a crown of thorns on his head. And you see the trails of blood down his face dripping onto his clothes. And as he starts getting closer to you, all of a sudden he holds out his hand, reaching for you. And you see the nail prints and the dripping blood. As he gets even closer, you see the stain on his side where the spear was, was pierced, where the spear pierced him. And then you hear him say this. I beseech you by the mercies of God, the mercies that I have shown you, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to me. What would your response be? How would you respond to such a vision like that if you could see Jesus and see what he did, see his blood all over him, get a glimpse of the reality of what he paid, and then he says, I am calling you to live as a living sacrifice, to give yourself, not to be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might begin to live like a true follower of Jesus. What would you do? What would be your reasonable service? You understand what I'm saying here? What would be your reasonable service? What would be the basics of what you begin to understand that you should do in response? Not trying to earn a place with God, but as this devotion that is just so overwhelmed with the wonder of who he is that you've got to somehow respond. You've got to somehow give your all to him because this God, this king of kings, is so great, so glorious, so beautiful, so loving that he deserves my absolute, complete devotion. Anything less than that is not fitting for what he did for us. You understand half-hearted Christianity is, is a disgrace. It's a disgrace for what he did on Calvary. It's a disgrace for what he paid. It's trampling underfoot the atonement because we don't see the reality of it. If we understood what the atonement is, our hearts would be so ablaze with love and devotion to God that you couldn't be kept out of the church. Instead, we've got to beg people to come to church. What's wrong with that picture? You understand what I'm saying? What's wrong with the picture? You have special services and a handful of people come out. I understand some of you had some things to do, but the reality is, is, is it really things that you have to do or are there some things that need to take precedence, some things that become more important? where our devotion to Christ is to define everything. And he's not to be a part of our life, but he's to be the definer of our life. So, can you give evidence that you are truly a saved person? Can you give evidence, clear evidence? As if after this service, you were interviewed, I interviewed you, and say, give me evidence that you're a Christian. And it's not enough to say, I prayed the sinner's prayer. What evidence of your life? Do you have the proof of fruit in your life that you are a follower of Messiah? Do you bear the fruit of the Spirit to such an extent that it's obvious that you are walking with Jesus? Or is it something that you are still walking in the fruit of the flesh? You're still living like you basically did. There's been no real change because you've not had a passion to serve this God. You wanted him to get you to heaven, but you didn't want him to transform, to revolutionize your life. In verse 18 of chapter 3, you see, this just two verses later after God so loved the world. Jesus said, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. You see, every person is under wrath. Every single person is under divine wrath until they come to the foot of the cross and they receive the atonement. They receive the benefits of the atonement, the transformation of the atonement, and then that wrath is removed 
And they are now in a place of favor where God can give favor to them, which is his blessing and the sanctifying work of his spirit and the wonder of his presence being real and active in our life. John chapter 8, we have this beautiful account of a woman that's caught in adultery. And the beautiful account is not that the woman was caught in adultery, but what Jesus does. And so she was caught in the act of adultery. Now, I've always wondered, why wasn't the man there as well? Because the law said that they both should be stoned. Okay? But, hey, you know, guys got away with it, so that was all right. But... Here she was. And you see the scribes and Pharisees, the lawyers, brought this woman to Jesus trying to trip him up to give a reason why they could try him in the religious court. So it wasn't out of kindness. It wasn't out of compassion to that woman. It was out of hatred for Jesus they were doing this. But they didn't know who they were dealing with. They had no idea. I mean, they kept trying to trip him up. And how do you trip up an all-knowing God? I mean, it's like, now, of course, they didn't understand that about him. But still, never, they didn't trip him up for anything. All these little games they played. And they failed one after another after another. And so Jesus stoops down. He begins writing in the dirt. We, do, we are not told what he wrote. It's worthless to speculate. I know people like to speculate, but it's all worthless. We don't know. They kept talking to him, bringing out her sins, and what are you going to do? And finally, Jesus straightened up. He made the statement, okay, you, have, whoever of you is without sin, you can cast the first stone. And it tells us in the account that the oldest men were the ones to begin to leave first because they had all those years of the knowledge of sin in their life. And you see, all their sacrifices in the temple wasn't enough to do away with that. He was, they were guilty, and it was the younger ones that were the last to leave because they didn't see it as clearly as the older ones. But their guilt was just as great. Finally, everybody's gone except Jesus and this woman. And Jesus could have reached down and taken one of those stones that those men dropped and threw it at the woman because he was the only one there that was without sin. He was the only one there that had the right to execute divine justice against this woman. But here's what Jesus said. Woman, where are your accusers? Has no one come to condemn you? No one, sir, she said then neither do I condemn you. You understand what he's saying right there? I have the right to do it, but I do not condemn you. And then he went to the woman. He says, go now and leave your life of sin. Jesus knew what was in that woman's heart. He knew she was a, a, a sinner that she had done all kinds of vile, evil stuff. She deserved divine wrath. But he also knew at that moment, in the agony of her sin being exposed, the guilt that was upon her, he knew there was something in that woman that wanted change. She wanted out, but didn't know how to get out. How do you find a way out when you are caught in the act? You are guilty. You can't lie your way out. You can't make excuses. You can't blame other people like we like to do so much. She was guilty. Now there was only one escape, and that could only come through God. Anybody here that is not a true follower of Jesus, if you're a backslider, you are guilty before God. Right now, you are guilty. Your sins are piling up one upon another. And somebody has to pay for your sins. Somebody has to die for your sins. And if you will not look to Christ, who already paid the price, then you will have to pay the price. And when you stand before God, you will find that your guilt will cause you to be separated from him forever. If you are not right with God, this God right at this very moment is offering you a pardon. 
is offering you the way of escape from the consequences your sin deserves. But if you come to this Christ and you come on his terms, you don't come on yours. You don't negotiate with him because there is no negotiating. You come to him in the reality of your sin. You come to him in your horrendous need and you cry out to him, have mercy on me, forgive me, O God. Those are not magical words. But when those words are backed up with true repentance and the desire for total transformation of the life, God responds with power. You understand? He responds with power. The power to forgive, the power to transform, the power to make new, the power to give brand new life to a person that has been dead in sin. Backslider. You are dead in your sins. You once knew Christ. You have trampled him underfoot through a lukewarm life or the practice of sin or whatever it is. You are outside of salvation. And this God is calling you to run home. Because somebody's going to pay for your sins. And backslider, you're either going to pay for it or you're going to run home to Jesus and he'll be the one that will take the penalty. But the choice is yours. Because you once knew him is not enough. Because you go to church every week is not enough. Because you give tithes is not enough. Are you in the place where you have truly abandoned your life to him and cried for the mercy of Christ's atonement to cleanse you from sin and the whole desire to abandon yourself to Father, we come before you now in the precious name of Jesus. Lord, you know every single person here, every single one. And Lord, you have offered us this, this gift that we cannot even wrap our minds around. Lord, it was I did such a poor job even trying to explain the wonder of the cross, the wonder of the atonement, Lord, because it is infinitely beyond what human minds and human lips can even speak. Lord, enough truth has gone forth that any that are not right with you, any of those who are true backsliders, that you are inviting them to receive the benefits of the atonement. You are inviting them to run to the foot of the cross, to a God that longs to show mercy to those who will turn from their sins by turning to him. So, Lord, I'm asking for anybody here that's not right with you, that you'd bring them home, that you'd bring them home, not this little prayer that doesn't change anything, but God, a revolution, a spiritual revolution of the life that transforms a person from the inside out. That you might be glorified through a frail individual that is reconciled with you and they find the wonder of favor with you that they can know the depths and the heights and the riches of your love, this love that passes human understanding. God, call them to yourself. If you are not a follower of Jesus or if you're a backslider, I hope I've done a good enough job in helping you understand your horrendous guilt before God. That is a message of love that will bring to you the reality that you are at war with him. It's the love of God that compels you to repent. It's the goodness of God that is striving right at this very moment to lead you to salvation. You cannot rely upon what you did or how you were raised. Salvation must become personal and real to you. You must come to the place and own the reality of your sins. And you must come before God and be willing to confess those sins and deal with those sins at the foot of the cross. And then at the same time receive by faith the promise of his forgiveness and reconciliation with him. You must embrace that. You are not good enough to go to heaven. And if you continue in a path of rebellion against God, your sin is going to get greater and greater and greater and have greater consequences. More and more pain and sorrow and misery is going to keep multiplying. It will not get better for you. And you'll make it harder and harder as days go by and years go by. You'll make it harder to come to Christ. That's why today is the day of salvation for you. Today is the day to come home. Backslider, today is the day to come home. In the story of the prodigal son, there were two prodigals. You had the one prodigal that lived a wild life. You had the second prodigal that stayed in the father's house. Both of them were estranged from their father. Both needed to be reconciled to their father. We just think, well, those bad people out there, you know, they're the ones who need to get saved. And uh, if you're not walking with Jesus in reality, you're one of those bad people then. Your sin has placed you at war with God. 
but the tender love and mercy of Christ is reaching out to you, pleading with you to run home, to run home. I'm going to ask everybody to please stand. If you're a backslider and you've never really given your life to Christ, I'm going to open this altar up in just a moment. And I want you to come to this altar right away. I don't want you to delay. Don't give over to fear of man and pride and all the, the, the excuses that are there. If you're not right with God, there's only one thing that should be on your heart right now to get right. That's all that matters. That's all that matters. The only thing that will keep you from an altar of repentance and getting right with God is you have an idol in your life that is greater than God. You'll not give up that idol, and you better hope when you breathe your last that it, that idol can save you. But I'll give you a guarantee that idol can. So he's calling you to the only salvation that there is, to the only one who can save you, to the only one who can forgive you of all your crimes, the only one that can give purpose and meaning and joy to your life. He's calling you to that. Will you receive his gift? Will you receive from him the wonder of reconciliation that he offers you? And so backslider, Anybody here that you have never given your life to Christ, if you want to come home, I want you right now to come up to this altar so I can have somebody pray with you. Is there anybody here, you are not right with God, and you know right now you need to get right with him. I want you to step down this aisle and surrender your life to him right now. Come forward. This is the most important decision of your life. And what you do with this decision will determine your eternity. What will you do with Jesus? I'm going to delay just a moment here. If I've got to beg you to come, then you're really not coming. There's a God that is longing to forgive you, to restore you, backslider, to give you new life, to deliver you from your Laodicean lukewarm condition, and to set a holy fire burning inside of you. One last call. Is there anybody here that you need to come to Christ? And you need to run home as a prodigal to Christ. Father, you know every single person here by name. You know the reality of their life. You know whether they are really walking with you or not. And Holy Spirit, I ask that you would do the work you were sent to this planet to do, to convict of sin, righteousness, and of judgment. Those who are not right with you, Lord, be the hound of heaven and haunt them with the reality of this word, of your word, the reality of their condition, that they would see that their life of sin is only going to cause them more and more misery, and that you are the only remedy to that pain of sin and the suffering that comes from it. Hound of heaven, pursue them, give them no rest. And Lord, I'm asking that you do something in the church, that you help them, each of us, to understand a little bit better the atonement and the wonderful gift of Calvary. Lord, it was an ugly, brutal act. And you endured that because you truly have loved us. You cared for mankind. Help us to understand the atonement more than we ever have, to see the cross as the expression of God's love most wonderfully and powerfully manifested to us. And may we understand how it's to be applied to our life, that we might live out the benefits of, of the atonement. And there are so many benefits that come out of a life in Christ. Lord, the greatest of all is reconciliation. And we can draw nearer and nearer and nearer to our God if we just choose to understand that he's made the way into that most holy place by the blood of Christ. We can approach that most holy place. We can approach the throne of God. That we can know this God in a real and intimate manner because of Calvary. Because of what you've done for us. 
Lord, it's also within it is healing and all the other things that are part of the atonement. Those are benefits beyond what I've even been talking about. But Lord, we need to be Christians that begin to understand what you have done and can do in us because of your work on Calvary. So Jesus, we ask for a deep and powerful work in your people. In Jesus' name.